Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Herb. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. A um, bit paranoid about what my voice will be telling you now from the last presentation, so uh, uh, bear with me as I just get my, uh, my notes uh, in order. Um, it's a real honour, actually, to be invited to speak to you. As Herb said, not many politicians are asked to do that. Also quite intimidating, uh, I have to say. Uh, although, I should start with some thanks to Donald Trump, because he hasn't half lowered the bar of what counts for a... <laughs> a thoughtful political contribution these days. It's a pretty low bar now, and I'm sure I hopefully can get over it. Um, I'll start with uh, something that you may not expect to hear from somebody like me, and that is I'm disillusioned with politics. Now, some of you might think, oh yeah, sour grapes, because he lost to Corbyn. Uh, and I can assure you it, it's not. Uh, I'll just share with you one anecdote from uh, the leadership contest of 2015. You know, Herb, you mentioned being the front runner or the favourite. Well, I've been in that position before and uh, that didn't go too well. But I was in the middle of that race and I, I knew I was kind of struggling, but I was still fighting. There was two weeks to go. Uh, you know, Jeremy was getting all the support, but I was in a, in a church in Sheffield, a uh, packed house, um, and I was, it was kind of going for broke, really, knowing that I really had to cut free and really try and win people over. And I gave what I thought was a pretty good speech and I really kind of spoke from the heart. And at the end of it, the hands went up and the chair said, OK, well, first question, Jeff at the back. And uh, it was bare minds of the church, just to remind you. Jeff says, uh, Andy, I've been listening to you for the last 20 minutes and I yeah, really agree with everything that you've said and the way that you've said it as well. So, but do you realise that you've been speaking for the last 20 minutes under a sign that says, repent, JC is coming? <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of went, oh... And I kind of felt at that point it was, uh, the, game was, uh, the game was kind of, uh, the game was up. Um, but to come back to that point, why am I disillusioned with politics? I'm disillusioned because I've come to the conclusion after 16 years in Westminster that Westminster is incapable institutionally of solving the issue that I came into politics to fix. And to tell you what I mean by that, I have to tell you my, my story, if you like, my journey. As Herb said, I was born... Uh, in Liverpool. Uh, don't hold that against me, those of you who essentially have a vote in, uh, in May. Um, but when I was one, my dad got a job in Manchester, so I moved halfway. I've classically been of both, both cities. Um, my earliest political memory was watching uh, Boys from the Black Stuff with my mum and dad. Um, they weren't political activists in any way. We weren't particularly a political family. They were just ordinary Labour voters. Uh, but it kind of planted a seed that there was something wrong, really, unfair about the way people were treated. Through the 80s, uh, the miners' strike. I was living in, in the Lee area where there were lots of coal mines, so that, that you know, built that feeling that something wasn't quite right. 1987, to my great surprise, somebody at school suggested I apply for Cambridge. And I didn't think I could go to Cambridge, but then I applied and somehow uh, got in and went to Cambridge 1988. You know, it was kind of the first, kind of, for me, the first real awakening that there were two worlds here in this country, really two worlds, and I couldn't really relate one to the other, the one where I'd grown up and the one that I was now in, in Cambridge. I wasn't used to being in supervisions in Cambridge where these people, same age as me, would stride into the room and just hold forth with these opinions on everything. You know, it took me a year to work out they were talking complete rubbish, but it, it sounded and looked brilliant for, the, for, for that year. And I always had that kind of imposter syndrome, you know, I'd get the tap on on my shoulder and you know, I struggled to kind of find my feet in that world. But then we get to 1989 in the Easter holiday from my first year in Cambridge, uh, Hillsborough happened and I was back at home. I'm an Everton supporter by background. I was at the other semi-final on that day and I uh, was sat in the pub that night, April the 15th, 1989, as my friends came home from Hillsborough and these stories of horror uh, were just then laid before us. And obviously, as you know, within a matter of days, those same people were being blamed uh, for what happened. The newspapers started to blame them. And when I got back to Cambridge, I was then back in that world and people started to repeat what the newspapers were saying in these kind of rarefied rooms. And, and I was like, no, you, you've got it all wrong. You don't understand. And it, it the frustration of those two worlds really kind of, you know, it, it's hard. You know, I, I really kind of found it hard to kind of reconcile one from the other. The country very, very uh, divided. And I... I suppose it's that kind of sense of injustice, of things aren't fair for people from a certain part of the country that in the end politicised me and took me on a path uh, towards politics. And eventually I was uh, elected, uh, came into Parliament in 2001. And while I'm very proud of many things that 
we did when I was in the government um, and an MP, I became aware that these two worlds still existed. And the Cambridge world was basically the Westminster world as well. There was a connected world, a world of people who knew each other and knew how to get things done and knew how to make things work for them, and an unconnected uh, world back at home where people didn't have those uh, doors open for them and didn't know those people in positions of power. And I kind of thought, while I was still very proud of lots of what Labour did, that we would change that world, we would challenge that privileged uh, world, and we would start to open it up. And to be honest, what I saw as a backbencher, then as a junior government minister, was basically what New Labour was doing, which was trying to ingratiate itself with that world, rather than challenge it, really, if I'm absolutely honest with you. And that constantly posed a problem for me, because I kind of, as I say, always lived, I always felt I've kind of been in a bridge between these two worlds of our country, kind of living in both of them simultaneously. And, you know, it always produced these conflicts uh, within me. But these two worlds of mine came into absolute direct collision uh, in 2009, when, as Herb says, by complete quirk of fate, I was invited as the culture secretary to go to Anfield on the 20th anniversary. Now, I was advised by the government not to go, and I agonised about whether I should go, because I knew the government had nothing to say, and I knew what all of those 30,000 people in that stadium would think. But on the same hand, the personal side of me couldn't not be there, knowing what I knew and knowing how my friends that I was at school with still felt. You know, the thought of not being there through cowardice was like impossible for me to kind of contemplate. But then the thought of being there was also impossible because I knew I had nothing to say. So it was like the ultimate dilemma, the clash of these worlds in which I've kind of constantly lived between. And in the end, I kind of sat down with my brothers and my mum and dad, as I always do in these difficult occasions. And I kind of said, we went through it. And I said, look, I want to be there, but what can I say? And my younger brother said to me, look, it's quite simple, really. Go if you're going to do something for them. If not, stay away, because it would be worse. And it was at that moment, basically, I kind of resolved to go and, in the end, uh, do something. I kind of knew that something was going to happen that day, but I almost kind of wanted it uh, to happen. And then when I came back to Westminster, when everyone had seen what had happened on the 20th anniversary, I then went into this process of trying to set up the Hillsborough Independent Panel. And I can't tell you what that was like and how hard that was, given the personal feelings I had about the issue. Uh, and the people I knew who were still traumatised by it. When I was in meetings with cabinet colleagues and senior civil servants who were trying to block every single thing that I was doing, and I was looking at them impassively just trying to do this, and then I was thinking of the people I knew back home, and on more than one occasion I went back to my flat at night and out of sheer frustration just wept because I just couldn't reconcile what was, what was unfolding. Uh, more than one occasion I considered resigning from the cabinet uh, over it. But eventually, we did establish it in the way that I wanted it to be established, and eventually the truth was told. I'm telling you this story just to illustrate my main point, which is what, what I'm coming to, uh, really. The question is, I'll just ask you all to ask is, how, if we had a proper political system in this country, how could it possibly, how could it possibly leave an entire city 30 miles from here crying injustice for 30 years? 20 years, sorry, with nobody listening. How, how, how could it? How, how could a representative democracy let that happen? And then, you know, how, if you then t take a, a step on from that, you know, how can this system still represent us properly if that's the way that it works, where it hears the voices of some people, the connected world, but not that unconnected uh, world? You know, the, the, the rooms of parliament, the committee rooms, were even used for the cover-up on Hillsborough. Uh, and that shows you how, in my view, Parliament is incapable uh, of, of dealing with, with an issue uh, like this. And it kind of brings me to my, my kind of central uh, contention, really. And it's that Westminster politics, as it is, the Westminster system, is absolutely incapable of responding to the challenge of our times. It's responsible, in my view, for the referendum result, because the communities that that kind of fought back through the referendum. They're the ones that have never had a true voice in the parliamentary system. If you think about Westminster and Whitehall, it's three institutions, the House of Commons, the House of Lords, and the government civil service. And in two of those institutions, they are completely unaccountable and, and unelected, and yet they make the vast majority uh, of the decisions. And some parts of the country 
have got hundreds of voices batting for them in those two worlds, the House of Lords and the Government Civil Service. But most of the poorest parts of our country have one voice, their MP, and nobody else. And this system that we've got is never going to deliver for them, ever. It really is not. You know, in a highly centralised political system, which is what we've got in this country, where, you know, we don't have regional government, we have one government in Westminster. Only one of the worlds of our country can dominate down there, both can't, and it's that highly connected uh, world that, that dominates everything. And so the Whitehall and Westminster system, in my view, will never give true and fair and equal representation uh, to those, those outlying poorer uh, parts of the country. They will forever be playing second fiddle uh, to, the, to, the, um, to, the connected, uh, to the connected world. And that's why I don't believe Westminster can fix the challenge. It's responsible for the referendum because it goes far deeper than concerns about Europe. This is a deep-seated anger about feeling abandoned by the kind of political class. So it created it, and now it can't fix it. Look at what's happened since the referendum. The people campaigning for justice on Orgreave, very linked to Hillsborough, same police force, four, five years earlier, they were just told to go away. Nobody died, go away. Look at what else has happened. We've had grammar schools introduced without an electoral mandate. You know, this, this world is closing ranks again. And actually, from my point of view, Hillsborough is the one that got away. Hillsborough is the one we forced open. But actually, they're closing ranks again now, and it won't, the same won't happen uh, for others. So I've concluded the way to change this world is not to stay within it and fight within it, but to challenge it from the outside. And that's why I've decided to put myself forward uh, for, the, um, for the mayor of Greater Manchester. The arrival of devolution in England, in my view, is the biggest chance we will ever get in this country to rebalance it from south to north. And I'm determined to, to devote what remains of my political capital to that mission, to show that if you give us the chance to do things for ourselves, we will do them uh, better than the rest uh, of the country. We will definitely make better decisions uh, than Whitehall and Westminster wait. You know, Whitehall and Westminster is like, for me, in an era of multi-channel TV, it's like trying to broadcast four-channel TV to the country. You know, one voice in a posh southern accent trying to speak for everybody. It's just not going to work. We need to do something fundamentally different. And devolution is our chance to do something fundamentally uh, different. You know, a small example. I would want to set a goal here in our city of saying no rough sleeping by 2020 and asking everybody to contribute in their own way to achieving that goal. Because when you get to, if you achieve things like that, we can make Manchester what I think people here want it to be, a beacon of social justice to the rest of the country. And I think in the end, politics will change more by taking inspiration from what happens in Greater Manchester rather than direction from Westminster. That, I think, is how the country will change. I think cities around the world, if you look, are increasingly the biggest force for social change. If you look on issues like climate change, this is where the progressive and uh, new thinking is coming from. It's not coming out of, of government systems which are struggling to make sense of this uh, fast uh, changing world. Change will increasingly come uh, from, the, from the bottom up. So what I would say to you all is, regardless of your politics and regardless of who wins in May, give, give your energy to it because it will be what we all make it. We need to build it up and we need to demand real change in the way this country uh, works and a real uh, voice for the communities that haven't been heard uh, for, for many years. I'll finish on this, on this point. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of be cynical about, will this lead to any real change? But what I want to remind you of is the fact that Manchester has a proud history of changing politics and changing the world. Uh, it is the home of radical forward thinking. In the early... 19th century, it was the place where the cooperative movement was founded to make food more affordable to ordinary working people. In the late 19th century, the Trades Union Congress was founded here, uh, just about less than a mile from this, from this building. And that gave a voice and representation to ordinary working people. In the 20th century, the suffragette movement was based here. And that gave a voice and a vote to half of the population. And what I'm saying is in the 21st century, this city should lead the devolution movement. 
to give real power and a real voice to the communities that Westminster has left behind. I think we've reached a point now where it's not cynicism about politics isn't just the politician's problem, it's your problem too, because the collapse of trust in the political system is poisoning the atmosphere on our streets. It's causing hate and division wherever, wherever we look. We can't just sit back and let this happen. We have to try uh, something, something different. So what I'm saying, I suppose, in summary, is it, it is time for something different. Devolution in England is the best hope that we've got. Greater Manchester is at the forefront uh, of it, which gives us a unique opportunity, but responsibility to show that we can make it work. This place has changed the world in the past before, and I believe it can do so again. I believe it needs to do so for the good of our society and the health of our democracy. It will be stronger the more that all of you invest your energy in it. So that's my final message today. Come and join the devolution revolution. Thanks very much indeed for listening.